Chief of City and State, and I am here once again on location in San Juan, Puerto Rico, with my good friend and colleague, Herson Barrero. Today, our guest is Kenneth McClintock. He is the former Lieutenant Governor of Puerto Rico. He's also the former President of the Senate and also Secretary of State. Mr. McClintock, thank you so much for joining us. Now, Herson is going to say the same thing in Spanish. Bueno, gracias por estar con nosotros en Serie en State TV. Este es parte del esfuerzo nuestro de traer a ustedes el camino a Somos, que es la conferencia anual invernal que se celebra aquí en San Juan, Puerto Rico. Y nuestro invitado, como yo dijo el colega, el colega Morgan, es Kenneth McClintock, quien ustedes conocen. Y ciertamente, gracias por la oportunidad, Kenneth. I, I start asking you. Uh, welcoming you and, and thank you for the opportunity. So this is great. I know you're a busy guy and, and now in the private sector, but you're still involved in politics. Can you give us now that you're no longer holding all those impressive titles or leading the Senate um, as president or the responsibility of Secretary of State or a government, uh, what you're still involved in politics. You have a passion for politics. Now that you're out from the fray, from being in the trenches of the political divide that exists everywhere, particularly pronounced in our island. Uh, can you give me an overview of how you see now, with all the knowledge that you have, the partisanship that you know exists and still gets worse on a daily basis by any standard, how do you see Puerto Rico right now? Well, first of all, welcome to you. You're welcoming me to your program, <laughs> and I'm welcoming you to Puerto Rico, since we are in Puerto Rico. But uh, Harrison, over the years, you know that, that I wasn't this diehard politician that was highly partisan and would not speak to people on the other side. You know, Puerto Rico is a very partisan, a very divided society. Uh, but I always tended to reach out. In fact, my, my theme when I was uh, a senator and later president of the Senate was, las buenas ideas no tienen color, good ideas don't have color. And I would entertain ideas from all sides. Good ideas have to be entertained always. And I think that probably one of the big defects that we have in, in Puerto Rico's political system is that we don't speak to each other. Uh, we discard everything that the past administration did, not because it's bad, but because it's not mine. And then you put forth your ideas, not because they're good, but because they are mine. And, and we've seen that switch around all the time. Right now, uh, we're, the legislature during I mean, this past session this fall has been working on, on tax reform. Okay, so you, you work on tax reform now. It'll go into effect beginning of 2011, uh, within a year and a half of the primaries and less than two years before the elections. Chances are that those that are in power now won't be in power after the elections, just like those that, those that are out of power now were in power before the past elections. We have a switch around every four years in Puerto Rico. So if you can't have a seeking of consensus, a speaking across the aisle, and try to agree on things by consensus, then nothing lasts in Puerto Rico. And that creates a very divisive situation and a very unstable situation. Businesses in Puerto Rico cannot be operating based on you chain, changing the rules of the game every four years. You know, if, you're gonna, if you want people to make a long-term investment in Puerto Rico, you have to have rules for those who are going to make an investment that will be uh, operational for eight, 10, 12 years at the very least. Uh, that is not happening in Puerto Rico today. And it, does, it hasn't happened generally in the past. You know, it's, it's, it's interesting. I mean, your background is, is really fascinating. You were the co-chair of the New Progressive Party, or the chair of the New Progressive Party, which, for our, those who don't know, is kind of like the equivalent of your Republican Party here. No, and, no. I was a co-chair of the Democratic Party, of, of the Hillary Clinton campaign. And that, that's exactly what I was yeah, going to point but out. It's the Democratic Party. I'm, I'm a Democrat. I'm not a Republican. Right, but you're right. You're a Democrat. Yeah, the Democratic Party in Puerto Rico is divided into two factions. The pro-statehood faction, of which I'm a part of, and the pro-territory or pro-commonwealth or pro-colony or whatever you want to call it faction, pro-status quo faction, which is headed by state chair Roberto Prats. We work together. We even co-authored a book together. So, yeah. 
Well, what, what I was going to kind of get at is, you know, it, it's a misunderstanding oftentimes that Puerto Ricans are of one mind politically, or at least that's how it's interpreted oftentimes by the New York media. When we talk about, oh, there's a Puerto Rican candidate, all Puerto Ricans are going to vote one way. And if anything that I've taken away as, as, as a takeaway from the, our time down here is how divisive your politics is. And I'm wondering if the question of statehood, which we have largely not touched upon in these interviews, is actually a, a real albatross to your political discourse because it seems like the political alliance and the political parties revolve around fundamentally where you stand on the status issue and that cripples the discourse on all the other areas that are so important to your politics. Well, I think that the albatross for the past 116 years is the fact that we have not resolved our political status problem one way or the other. And we've been in this limbo of colonialism or territorialism or however you want to call it since 1898. You know, and we, we live under a non-permanent status that can go one way or the other. And, and we have not resolved that and that keeps us spinning our wheels. And what it does is that our economy is not based on permanent rules of engagement, it's based on temporary special treatment, tra tax treatments. And it is a, a law of economic nature that you will not be able to trigger, trigger uh, sustainable economic growth based on temporary situations. Uh, we had, for example, in 1976, Congress approved some rules for uh, manufacturing in Puerto Rico called Section 936 of the Internal Revenue Code. It was only applicable to Puerto Rico. So when 60 years later, another president, in this case uh, Ronald Reagan, decided that he wanted to find ways to cut spending and cut uh, tax expenditures in the U.S., he finds this section that has no real support outside of Puerto Rico. So you did not have a whole bunch of uh, U.S. senators or congressmen fighting to keep that. We had to go out and ask the senators from New York or the congressmen from New Jersey or so forth that number eight or ten on their agenda after they dealt with all their own state's issues to please help us out on that issue. As a matter of fact, that section lasted 20 years but every five or six years it was being chipped away. And you cannot run a business if the rules of the game are gonna be changing on you every half decade. If you have permanent rules, one way or the other, whether the rules that apply to foreign investment in Puerto Rico if Puerto Rico were independent, or the investment that would apply to Puerto Rico if Puerto Rico were a state, whichever it may be, at least if the rules don't change, you will have investors that will come in and invest on a long-term basis. We don't have that in Puerto Rico. And as a result, you will find, if you're a young teenager, you will discover that there are no summer jobs in Puerto Rico. In the States, probably a third or half of high school students find a summer job. Not because the businesses they're working for need them to work during those months, simply because those businesses realize that they have an obligation to society and to help prepare kids to develop their work ethic. In Puerto Rico, only the sons of the owners of the business may get a summer job. Or I might say, you hire my son in your business and I'll hire your son in my business. That way it won't look like nepotism. But it's just a small class of, of young Puerto Ricans that get a summer job. And then later we complain that young people do not have a highly developed work ethic in Puerto Rico. You know, what you invest is what you get. That brings me to the point of, which is interesting, the role that the diaspora should be playing that isn't. Um, I know that there's no direction coming from here. And one of the things that we've embarked on in city and state in terms of the road to Somos and the winter conference or the fall conference that's coming up in November 5th through the 9th is a way to then hear from 
people here, uh, the ones that are being affected, you're the stakeholders. What is it that the diaspora does? You certainly have attended in your different capacities, different roles, both in New York, the SOMOS conference, and here you participate. As a matter of fact, I think we discussed the status issue on a panel. Yeah. Of course, I was on a separate side and you were on a separate side. You were on the wrong side, I was on the right uh, side. Well, you know, we all make mistakes <laughs> and I'm sure you'll correct yours. But the, the fact is that we have a role to play in terms that, that we, the diaspora, not only from New York, which is still holds the largest concentration of Puerto Ricans in terms of population, but also ele Puerto Ricans elected to the city council, state legislature, both in the Senate and in the assembly. What should be, never mind Florida and its expanding role because of the migration process, what is it that, for example, you mentioned 936, that's bridge under the water, it's gone. What is it that we need to do as Puerto Ricans in the diaspora because we're growing in numbers to be able to do this along with other Latinos who have to understand our particular predicament, but we do have, we're citizens, uh, you know, it, it, whatever you want to discuss about this. What do we have to do? What is it that you perceive that the diaspora can bring to this conversation or political pressure that hasn't been exerted? Well, I'll give you examples. There are things that can be done on an individual basis. Many members of the di diaspora have summer homes or vacation homes or winter homes or whatever. If 1% of the 5.1 million Puerto Ricans that live on the mainland, 1% in the next 12 months, decided to buy a vacation home in Puerto Rico, to come here in the summer, come here in the winter, come here whenever, which could later perhaps become a retirement home. If you bought it here instead of buying it in Florida, or instead of buying it in the Outer Banks in North Carolina or something like that, that could be 15 to 20,000 housing units at an average cost, maybe let's say $160,000 to pay $1,000 a month in, in, in mortgage. That would inject $2.4 billion in Puerto Rico's real estate market in the next 12 months. That would then help create a demand that doesn't exist right now in Puerto Rico because people are dropping off their homes right and left in Puerto Rico. Uh, it is thought that 30,000 Puerto Ricans on the average are leaving the island right now. I personally think it's more to the tune of 50 to 75,000. And we're at Is that a yearly, a yearly? On a yearly basis. Okay. On a daily basis, it's at least 1,757 full of people that leave and don't come back every single day. It's major. Just to give you an example, in the past four years, you've probably lost 300,000 population in Puerto Rico. For those of us who are of a greater age than, than Morgan, uh, you don't know what the Marielitos are probably. Or you might have read in the books. But in 1980, there was a huge exodus of 100,000 Cubans into the US. And they all went to live in one county of one state. And in spite of that, it created a national crisis that cost the election in part of one president. It cost the election of an obscure governor in the Midwest, I think it was the state of Arkansas, his name right. was Bill something, <laughs> uh, and his first lady was Hillary something. It almost cost the election of the governor of Puerto Rico. And that was because pe people were sent to Fort Smith and Juan Arias to concentration, uh, no, not concentration camps, to relocation centers while they decided what they were going to do with those Marielitos. And that was 100,000 people in almost all in one county, Dade County, one state, Florida. And what happened? Now you have 300,000 Puerto Ricans in the past four or five years, three times the number of Marielitos with diplomas from accredited institutions, with their life savings with them, leaving behind unpaid mortgages in Puerto Rico that are federally insured, this can become a real big national problem if we don't start addressing those problems here in Puerto Rico. And the diaspora, if only one out of every 100 Puerto Ricans living on the mainland in the next 12 months bought a vacation home in Puerto Rico, you inject $2.4 billion into the economy, as I said. And if you repeat that every year, 
for the next five years, you will have 5% of the diaspora, only one out of every 20, with a vacation home in Puerto Rico, but you have injected $12 billion into Puerto Rico's real estate economy. That would cause our real estate crisis to bottom out, and then prices would start going up gradually. And in Puerto Rico, there are three sources of investment income. One is the equity in your home, and with prices plummeting, nobody has any equity left in their homes. Probably half the properties here are underwater, meaning that they owe more to the bank than the property is, is, is valued at. The second was the dividends from Banco Popular stock. I don't know how long it's been since Banco Popular has not issued dividends. And the third was Puerto Rico government triple tax exempt bonds. And you know what's happening with that. So if we can at least get equity starting building up in Puerto Rico again, you will be helping Puerto Rico improve their economy and start reducing the number of Puerto Ricans that would feel obliged to have to leave Puerto Rico in this generation. Now, you just spoke about the bonds. Uh, when we interviewed the current Senate President, Eduardo Batia, he was... Very good friend. He, he was uh, I'm more than intimating, but he was saying that the economic crisis is not as dire as it is being portrayed and that, uh, head, that there is a certain faction of hedge fund managers on Wall Street who are trying to exaggerate the crisis in order to manipulate the bond prices. Do you think there's any validity to that theory? Well, I wouldn't put it past anybody in Wall Street what they could be doing. Uh, but everything I see anecdotally in Puerto Rico indicates that things are getting worse. Uh, give, I'll give you an example. According to Puerto Rico government statistics, they do a daily poll at the airport. And maybe you hear some, sometimes that you've been waiting for a flight, they come up and ask you, you know, where do you live and all that. Uh, from January to May of this year, there were 57,000 more employment, employments than deplanements. In other words, there were 50,000 more people getting on planes to go to the States than there were people arriving from the States. That is a horrendous statistic because the months when most people move from Puerto Rico are June and July because Papi, may leave in March to look for a job and sign up an apartment in Orlando. But mommy stays back home with the kids until school closes. And then in the summer, papi will send for the family. And it was that way back in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s, when the Borrero family perhaps moved to the States, and it's the same situation now. So if 57,000 more net more people left Puerto Rico from January to May of this year. I don't want to imagine what happened this summer. There are a number of two or three moving companies here, the English called Mayflower and a few others. They have waiting lists of months to handle your, your household moving to the States. There's not enough trailers, there's not enough employees, there's not enough ships to to move people out of people's furnishings out of Puerto Rico. I mean, everything I see anecdotal says the contrary.